I ended the previous part of this lecture with this question, so let's have a look at it. Notice that both objects are connected between the same hot and cold object. The left ends of both will end up at the temperature that I've called TH, and the right end of both will end up at the temperature that I've called TC. And so the temperature difference across both of them will be the same, and so neither of C or D can be correct. Also, they're made of the same material, and thermal conductivity is a material property. So the fact that they're of the same material tells us the two thermal conductivities are the same, and so E and F can't be right. And so which of A or B is it? Well, remember that the flux is going to be proportional to the area, and all the other things in here, the thermal conductivity and the slope of the T versus X graph, are the same, and so it's a nice simple proportionality with area. And so 2, which has the larger area, is going to have the larger flux through it. Let's turn our attention from conduction to radiation. Now, all objects emit electromagnetic radiation, and they do it by many different mechanisms. To fully study this is far more than could be done in one or probably even two courses, so we're going to restrict our attention to what's called thermal radiation, which, for things at room temperature, is mostly in the infrared part of the spectrum, which is why on a day-to-day -day basis you're not really aware that the things all around you are radiating. But, of course, when things get hot enough, then a significant fraction of the radiation emitted by them ends up in the visible part of the spectrum, and you can see it. This is particularly spectacular with stars, and for example, one of the things you can then see is that the color that's emitted depends on the temperature of the object. So both color and surface brightness, it turns out, will depend on temperature. What we want to understand is how to predict how much thermal energy will be exchanged by two objects because of radiation. So let's think about a hot object and a cold object that are close to each other. The hot object will be radiating, and so that means it's emitting electromagnetic radiation. Some fraction of that is going to get absorbed by the cold object, and so there is a transfer of heat in that direction. But remember that the cold object is also radiating. It's just radiating less, and so there's also a transfer of heat back the other way. However, because the transfer from the cold object to the hot object is smaller, then, as the zeroth law of thermodynamics dictates must be true, the net transfer of heat is from the hot object to the cold object. Overall, the amount of thermal energy depends on the temperature difference between the two objects. So, for example, if the hot object is a little less hot, there will be less transfer in that direction. But similarly, if the cold object is a little warmer, then there will be more energy transfer back the other way towards the hot object, once again reducing the overall magnitude of the transfer of thermal energy. The transfer of thermal energy also depends on distance. You should be able to observe this intuitively in your everyday life. If you turn on a stove element and hold your hand at a large distance from it, you're not going to notice very much transfer of heat to your hand. But if you put your hand close to the element, you're going to feel a much larger amount of heat transferred from the element to your hand. So, overall, what we want to know is how the heat depends on both the temperature difference between the objects and on the distance between them. In general, this is quite complicated, but there are some simple cases we can look at, and the simplest is a point source. So imagine we have a very small source, and it is radiating electromagnetic radiation in all directions, equally in all directions, with some power that we'll just call P source. This is just like the power that would be printed on a light bulb, except a light bulb really can't be approximated as a point source. It doesn't radiate in all directions because the base blocks radiation in some directions. Now imagine we put some surface around our source, centered on the source, a spherical surface 
of area A. And let me stress, this is not a real surface, it's not a physical object, it's an imaginary surface and we're thinking about the flux through it. Then because energy is conserved, all of the energy that leaves the source must pass through this surface, or in other words, the flux through the surface must be equal to the power of the source. And that, of course, is equal to a flux density times the area of this surface. And by the way, it doesn't matter how large we make the surface. The argument still holds that all of the energy leaving the source must pass through the surface. So note, this first part of the relationship is true for any surface enclosing the source. In fact, no matter what shape it is. But this second part is only true for a sphere centered on the source because we need to use the argument that the flux density is the same everywhere on the sphere. This now lets us find an expression for the flux density at any distance. So if our sphere has a radius r, then just solving for the flux density, we see that it's the power of the source divided by the area, and that area is just the area of a sphere, 4 pi r squared. And I'll remind you that this is precisely valid only for a point source or for a spherical source. But very often, it's approximately true for many other things, particularly when we're looking at radiation far away from a source. This now allows us to find amounts of energy transferred from this source. Suppose this source was maybe the sun, and we think about a solar panel at a large distance r from it, and that solar panel has an area AP. Then the power received by the solar panel would just be the flux density at its distance from the sun times the area of the panel. Now let's turn our attention to how these things depend on temperature. Now, again, in general, this is very, very complicated, and there are many, many possibilities. But let's focus on something called a black body, which is an idealized absorber of radiation. Note that what this means is that all of the radiation received by this object is absorbed. None of it is reflected. Now, most things are nowhere near a black body. For example, this textbook, if you look at it, you can see a little bit of reflection off of it. And in particular, if you arrange so that the light is reflecting off of it at a high angle, it reflects well enough that you can even see images in it. So this is not black body behavior at all. What we're talking about with a black body is something where there's no reflection. Now, that textbook doesn't behave like a black body in the visible range of the spectrum, but it may actually be a pretty good black body in the infrared. So the black body absorbs all incident radiation independent of angle and wavelength, and it then re-emits it thermally. I'm not going to go into detail about what we mean by thermally, but what it means essentially is that there's a characteristic shape to the spectrum unlike something like, say, a neon light, where if you look at its spectrum, it has bright emission lines, that's characteristic of very non-thermal emission. I'm not going to derive the relationship between the thermal flux and the temperature of the black body. That would get us into a bunch of quantum mechanics that's way beyond this course, so I'll just give it to you. The thermal flux density at the surface of the object, which is also called radiant emittance, is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. This is called the Stefan Boltzmann law, and the constant out front is called the Stefan Boltzmann constant, and I'll leave it to you to look up that constant. The, the total power emitted now is just going to be that thermal flux density times the area of the surface of the object. A non-black body emits less than this, and so we put a factor out front to reflect this, which is called the emissivity. I'll just finish up by briefly talking about convection, which appears all over the place. One of the things it does is take our nice simple cases and make them much more complicated. So for example, if we think about the wall of a house where there's conduction going on through it, there's also convection that's important. 
if the temperature outside is some Tc and there's some Tw in the warm inside, then what's going to happen is that the air near the wall is exchanging thermal energy with the wall and cooling down. That tends to make it sink and you get a convection roll in the room. And so the temperature near the wall ends up being less than the temperature out in the room as the air travels down the wall, exchanging thermal energy with it. And more or less the reverse process goes on on the outside. Actually, calculating this is horrendously complicated and involves a lot of fluid dynamics.